It's written on my pad as unraveling the presence of the transcendental object. Now, what this means is uh, I don't simply advocate the use of psychedelic plants because I think they make us feel good and break down social barriers and patterns of habit and so forth, although they do all that. But I believe that perception itself tends to um, take the shape of its vessel. You know, the alchemists visualized mind as mercury, and mercury being a liquid will always flow to the lowest level and take the shape of the vessel. And I think that in the, in the potential multiple-dimensional space of being, mind has flowed to the lowest levels of the vessel, and that what happens when we perturb the mind-brain system with hallucinogenic uh, indoles is uh, it's as though we were to vaporize the mercury, and instead of taking the shape of the vessel at its lowest levels as a liquid, the mercury fills the vessel as a pressurized gas. And what this experience is, is uh, a seeing of higher dimension, literally, not metaphorically. This is what has to be understood, that you literally are seeing a higher dimension to reality. And uh, Ralph Abraham was here yesterday suggesting that because the world is such a complex system, it has many, many variables. Dimension, which seems like a word that people shrink from because it has some aura of mathematics about it, is not a difficult concept at all. Think of, dim of a dimension simply as a variable. So if I tell you that we have eight variables then we have an eight-dimensional phase space in which whatever we're talking about is going on. Well, obviously, the number of variables in the natural and human world is very high. So the degree to which we can perturb the mind out of its slovenly tendency to flow to the lower dimensions of the lattice and instead urge it to expand into the higher orders of the phase space, then we get a fuller picture of reality. Because I, I, it seems quite reasonable to me to say that what we call reality is a lower dimensional slice of a higher dimensional phase space. And we slice this higher dimension with the knife of language. Well, then we get a cross-section, like slicing through an agate or slicing through a fruit. Then we see the interior of it, but we do not see the seed from which it came, the tree which grew it, the death of that tree. In other words, the temporal dimension, to name but one, is not visible in the lower dimensional slice made by the knife of language. So we have to either create a higher dimensional language or use more than one language at once or create some other strategy for handling all these variables. What shamanism is, is a person who can go into these higher dimensions and understand enough of what they're seeing that for them it functions as a map of the lower dimensional world into which they are going to return. You've, many of you have heard me say, a shaman is someone who has seen the end. Well, this is just a, a kind of cute way of saying that the shaman has experienced the temporal dimension as a totality. The shaman has seen the beginning and the end. And that's what gives the shaman his or her peculiar psychic equilibrium. Because they're not like you and me. 
groping along down here in four-dimensional space, uh, trying to figure it out. For them, it's all of a piece. And this feeds back into their personality as a tremendous kind of authenticity. Well, we need to shamanize to save the planet. We need to create higher dimensional mappings of our world and the crisis in which we are in, in order to plot a way out of the cul-de-sac that the phonetic alphabet, monotheism, and print-created uh, linear monoculture has shoved us into. So the psychedelics are not ancillary, they're not peripheral, they're not secondary. They are the way to propel ourselves into these higher dimensional phase spaces. Eventually we will drag our computers with us, but you can't push the computer first because the computer must be programmed by people who have seen these things and know what they are uh, shooting for. What this process will inevitably become is uh, pressure on the evolution of language. Because you see, even though in the last few minutes I've presented it to you in a kind of imperative mode, where I'm saying, this is what we need to do, this is what we should do, this is what we will do. As a matter of fact, this is what we have been doing, and for a very long time as well. In fact, the entire progress of biology and culture, anthropology, can be seen as a kind of conquest of dimensionality that has occurred at an ever-accelerating rate, so that, you know, the earliest organisms were just literally groped their way through life. They couldn't see light or darkness. They rubbed up against something, and that's how they knew it was there. And then, through evolutionary selection, light-sensitive pigmented spots appeared on the surfaces of these things, and that gave them a gradient of sensation that told them the difference between light and darkness. Well, a further coordination of this ability, a, a further differentiation of this light-dark gradient gives eyes and the visual world. At the same time, that this is happening, uh, organs of motility are evolving. Well, now, meaning that so animals can move around more freely. They're not like algae or something stuck on rocks. Well, notice that when an animal, an animal that can move is already a master of a whole set of dimensions that are completely invisible to a creature which cannot move, let's say a sea anemone. What do sea anemones know of the fear of flying? You know, they don't know anything about it, because for them the world is not put together that way. But a gazelle coordinates itself in a higher dimensional space than the sea anemone. Similarly, once you reach the place in evolution where... Uh, language appears. Language is a way of destroying the primacy of the moment. In other words, pushing out from this very narrow domain called now into an anticipation of the future based on an extrapolation, an analysis of the past. This is a conquest of dimensionality adding variables, you see. And then, when you go into the realm of epigenetic coding, huge databases, so that nothing is ever forgotten, in a way the past ceases to fall away. The past is co-present with the present in a world where there is high-speed information and data retrieval. So, similarly, in our present circumstance, then, what we are pushing against is the, um, the envelope of the dimensionality of language. Language has hitherto been allowed to grow like uh, flopsy 
or Mopsy or one of them. Uh, in any case, it has not been uh, thought of as a process which could be guided by cultural engineering. But I think this has to be done if we are going to make the changes necessary to be made in the time that we have to make them.